It's been said that one can hear the roar of a lion five miles away. That the lion's roar can be as loud as 113 decibels. We know that lions, they are the king of the jungle. That they are powerful. That they are intimidating. That they seek and destroy. It's no wonder then that Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8 described our adversary, the devil, as like a roaring lion, one that we need to be aware of, one that is coming after us. Indeed, the devil, he is our enemy. The devil is loud. He is a bully, and he seeks to intimidate the people of God. He walks around seeking whom he may devour, and we do not want to become his lunch. We are giving warnings time and time again with respect to our adversary because he is so successful in his attacks, his snares and his tactics. He is cunning in all that he does. In fact, we see that he was successful even among the Christians in the first century in the book of Revelation. If you have your Bible, open it up to Revelation chapter 1. What we find in Revelation chapter 1 and then beginning in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, we find details about seven local churches where Jesus had spoken to them and warned them and reminded them about their enemy, the devil. And the Holy Spirit has recorded for us what was taking place in these seven local churches. Brothers and sisters, there was a battle that was ensuing. There was a spiritual battle between good and evil. The devil was going after the people of God. In fact, the entire book of Revelation shows us this. What's interesting is that the book of Revelation really pulls the curtain back on this spiritual warfare that the people of God were in then and that we are in even today. We see language like war, the devil making war with the people of God all throughout the book of Revelation. Now, many times people are quick to turn to chapter 12. Or chapter 20, when they want to read more about the devil and who he is and what he's all about. But it's interesting that Jesus began Revelation in chapter 2 and chapter 3 explicitly mentioning the devil numerous times. He started at the beginning because he wanted his people to know that indeed they had an enemy and that they were in a battle. Now, as you know, we've been talking about the book of Revelation, how it is a book for times like these. We have engaged in this study. Now, for the last three or four weeks, we've talked about the importance of this book in understanding the book of Revelation with the style and the content and the context and how to go about interpreting the chapters as we read through it. We have been reminded about our Savior, Jesus Christ, and how he is Alpha and Omega. He is the first and the last. He has the keys to both Hades and to death. He has all power and authority. And last Sunday morning, we were able to take a peek inside heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and see the awesome throne scene in heaven. We were reminded that, indeed, God is sitting on his throne, that God reigns, that he is supreme. Today, we need to talk about our great enemy. You see, you can't talk about the book of Revelation without talking about the devil. And there's so much information with respect to the devil. It is interesting that Jesus began this book in chapters 2 and 3 talking so much about the devil as he warned and as he encouraged his people. And if he did that for them, then brothers and sisters, it is important, it is critical for us to talk about the devil even today. We don't often talk about the devil. We don't really even talk that much about hell anymore. But make no mistake about it, my friends, we need to talk about our enemy, we need to know who he is, and we need to know how we can be victorious. What I want to do this morning to guide our thoughts, I want to read a little bit from Revelation 2 and chapter 3. And I want you to see what Jesus said with respect to the devil as he wrote to the churches in Asia Minor. As we read, I want you to do something with me, okay? As we read, I want you to take note, what can you learn? What do you see about the devil? What was Jesus trying to emphasize and what did he want his people to hold on to as they were in the midst of suffering. Let's read in Revelation chapter 2. And I want to begin in verse number 8. We're going to take just a few minutes. We're not going to read all of 2 and 3. But I want to look at a few verses here. And I want us to see what can we learn about our enemy, the devil. And then let's make some application. Look at Revelation 2 and beginning at verse number 8. The Bible says this. Jesus said this to the ancient church in Smyrna, right? The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. 
I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich in the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes." To him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But... I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds, and I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Look at chapter 3 and verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Powerful, isn't it? What did you learn about the devil? What did you see Jesus emphasizing to his people about Satan, about the devil, about their enemy? There are four things I want us to take home this morning as we talk about the one who is like a roaring lion, our enemy, our adversary, our devil. There are some things that we need to know, some things that the saints needed to hold on to and that we need to hold on to also. We need to know, ladies and gentlemen, number one, that the devil is real. The devil is real. Did you see the language back in chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9 as, as Jesus spoke to the brethren there in Smyrna? He reminded them in verse number 10, he said, Behold the devil. The devil is real. And Jesus was stressing this fact as he wrote to the Christians at that time. And if Jesus was stressing this fact, then it must be stressed today. Neglecting this point is a foolish thing for us to do. I know some of us may be thinking, Okay, we already know that the devil is real but do we, do we really believe that? It's interesting. There's a lot of people who profess to be Christians who don't believe that the devil is real. There's a study, and it goes back to 2009. It's old. It goes back to 2009 by Barna.org, or where you can find it there. And those who profess to be Christians, they were asked a question. Do you believe in the devil? Do you believe that the devil is real, that he exists? And 40% of them said no. 
40% of people who say that they believe in Jesus say that the devil does not really live, that he doesn't exist, that he's merely just some power or merely just some symbol of evil. Depending on how you look at those stats, it could be as high as 60%, but I think I know why some people believe that way. Because the same people that were interviewed were asked about the Holy Spirit, do you believe that the Holy Spirit is real? And many of them said no to that too. So yeah, if you don't believe what the Holy Spirit says, you're not going to believe that the devil is real. But for us as the people of God, do we believe that Satan is real? The Bible is stressing this point. Peter stressed this point. Jesus stressed this point. When you think back to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, you remember when Jesus was, being, was in the wilderness and being tempted for 40 days and for 40 nights? He had a conversation with the devil. And he told the devil to do what? He told the devil to flee. He told the devil to go. Well, if the devil is not real, then who was Jesus talking to, guys? Of course the devil is real. And the fact that so many people don't believe that he is actually real, I think is a testimony to his influence today. How do you think that would sit with the brethren in Smyrna, in Philadelphia, Thyatira, that were dealing with issues with respect to the devil? To hear that some would say, no, I really don't think that the devil is real. More importantly, how does that sit with God? Do not be deceived. You have an adversary. I have an adversary. He knows you by name. He knows me by name. And he is coming after us. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil is real. He is our enemy. And he is not just some mere symbol or evil or something like that. He exists. And let me tell you why this is so important. When people begin to suffer, who's the first person they typically blame? God. Why is that? When something bad happens in our life, the first person we go to, God, why are you doing this? Maybe it's because we haven't talked as much about the devil. You see, the devil is often behind much of the suffering of the people of God. And maybe sometimes our our view of God is skewed or wrong because we just haven't put as much emphasis upon the devil and the fact that he is real and the fact that he is coming after us as much as we should. That's what we see, guys, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Not only is that the devil is real, but the devil, the devil hates us. The devil hates the people of God. I know Joshua is going to say, don't use that word hate. We try not to use that word in the house. He strongly dislikes God's people. When you go back to Revelation chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9, look at it again. He said in verse number 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich in the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. You see what the devil was doing with the people of God? He was causing them to suffer to the point that some of them would be thrown into prison, and later on, some of them, like Antipas, would actually lose their lives. The devil, he hates the people of God. The devil is not interested in our well-being. He's not interested in your well-being at all. He has his own will. He has his own motives. He is out to destroy you and me. And when you read the book of Revelation, this is not a game. This is not something we play around with. The devil is one, is one that we need to take seriously. Turn over to Revelation chapter 12. We see in Revelation chapter 12 this war that's taking place. The, the word war is used a couple of times. We see this spiritual battle. And it's just interesting how the devil is described. John sees a sign in heaven in verse number 1. He sees another sign in heaven in verse number 3 where it says, Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. He's talking about the devil there, and we know that because when you drop down to verse number 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. I want you to notice just the language and the titles given to the devil. The great dragon denoting strength, denoting power. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old. That's connecting all the way back to the book of Genesis. The serpent of old who deceived Adam and Eve in the beginning. The murderer, the liar from the beginning. The serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. That's what he's all about. He hates you and he hates me. He's a deceiver and he wants us to be deceived about Jesus, about God, about God's word. 
He is a deceiver. He's been that way from the beginning. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser, take note of that, the accuser of our brethren, he is a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's an accuser. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God night and day. All throughout the Bible we see this language that the devil is our enemy. He was accusing Job in Job chapter 1 as he talked to God. In Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1, he was accusing the people of God then. The devil is our enemy. The language devil or Satan is the idea of accuser, slanderer, one who maligns, adversary, antagonist, enemy. The language is clear. He is out to get the people of God. Do you see that? Do you see what he was doing to those brothers and sisters in Christ in Revelation chapter 2 and 3? What Jesus does, he pulls the veil back to help the people of God then to see, yeah, you're suffering and it's because you have an enemy. And you need to take this enemy seriously. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus is emphasizing or emphasized to the people of God numerous times. The reason why so many of you are suffering and the reason why maybe so many of you have lost your first love, the reason why so many of you may be dead spiritually is because you have an adversary who's coming after you. And he's trying to destroy you. And if that was the case then, don't be naive to think that the devil is not after you. Cassandra, don't be naive to think that the devil is after you. He is. Vashon, the devil is after you. Ashley, the devil is after you. Mark, the devil is after you. He's after all of us, folks. He knew Job by name. He knew about the Israelites in Zechariah chapter 3 and Ezra chapter 2, 3 and 4. He went after David, and he was pretty successful to get King David to number all of the people in Kings and Chronicles. Oh, don't be mistaken, my friend. He knows you. We are on his hit list, which should really get us to think about some things, shouldn't it? It should really get us to think about sin for a moment. Should we not take sin much more seriously? And the warnings that have been given to us in the word of God, all the things the devil offers us, None of the things that he offers us are for our benefit. The social drinking. I'm so tired of hearing about social drinking. It's a lie from the devil, folks. It's a lie from the devil. The extramarital affairs. Oh, he offers, you know, people great things. The greed that we sometimes go after. The power, covetousness. All those things that the devil offers us and makes us to think they're so appealing. They're all lies. They're all lies. He hates us. And he was causing many of the Christians in the first century to suffer. Maybe sometimes the reason why so many of us are suffering is because the devil is really trying to get us. He is real, folks. But think about sin for a second. When we decide to engage in sin, look, we're falling right into the hands of, our dece- of the deceiver, which raises another question. We know that our enemy is real. We know that he hates us. He was going to cast some of them into prison. There was a battle that was taking place. If we know all of this, then why is it sometimes that we often fall short? Why do we sometimes really get excited about what the devil offers us and decide to follow down the path that he tells us to go down? Why do we do that sometimes? Have you thought about that? We know that he has nothing good for us. We have seen and we see warnings all throughout the word of God. So why do we sometimes listen to the devil and do what he wants us to do? Maybe it's because of this point here. Maybe it's because because the devil is powerful. Did you see the language back in chapter 2 and chapter 3 where Jesus, as he was writing to those churches, look back in chapter 2 and chapter 3, when Jesus, as he was writing to those churches there, He reminded them that some of them in verse 13, the church in Pergamon, for example, he said, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. That's powerful language. That's scary, isn't it? I know where you dwell. I know where you are living, and I know what is all around you. You are in the midst of Satan's throne. What's he talking about there? I think he's just talking about influence. Whether it's with emperor worship, idolatry, whatever the case may be, 
These Christians were surrounded by those who were under the influence of the devil and his will and who had really no concern for God and Jesus and for those who were trying to serve King Jesus. The language here, the devil being around or being in the midst of his throne is the idea of his power and his influence. The Christians in the first century, my friends, they were in the lion's den. They were in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. And they were in a battle for their lives. They were in a battle for their souls. Everywhere they turned, they could see the power of Satan. That's where they were living. Jesus makes it clear, look, Satan is behind all of this. He is the one that is attacking you. Why do you think the devil was trying to attack those Christians? Why was he going after them? What did he want, them, what did he want from them? I think ultimately he wanted one thing. He wanted those Christians to quit on Jesus. And if he could get them to quit on Jesus, to doubt, to have uncertainty, to stop fighting, then he would be successful. Oh, he would push the saints to the brink of death and sometimes even to the point of death. And if he could crush their hope, their confidence, their faith, in Jesus, he would win. He was punching them in the face, left jab and a right jab, time and time again, punching them in the face. And he would continue until he knocked them out. And for some of those Christians in the first century, some of those in the, even in the seven churches, some of them were being affected by the blows from the devil. Because Jesus, in almost all the letters, I believe, there's something that we find at the, at the end of each of those letters. He had to remind the people to do what? Repent. While he was encouraging them, he was also warning them and trying to get them to see, listen, you guys have gotten off track. And your enemy has been influencing you, and you need to come back. You need to repent, and you need to be zealous, and you need to remember who you are in Jesus and me. Folks, the devil is powerful. The saints were where Satan's throne was. They were surrounded by his power and in 2016, the devil has the same goals for us. He has the same power. He has the same goals for us. And we are living, make no mistake about it at all, we are living in the midst of Satan's throne. He is the prince of this world. And we see his influence everywhere, don't we? Oh, I'm not talking about the news stations. We see his influence here in this church. We see his influence in our homes. We see his influence when we look inside our hearts sometimes. We see his power and his influence. And a question for all of us, has the devil pushed us to the brink of quitting on Jesus? That's what he ultimately wanted the people to do. The question for all of us this morning, are we going to allow the devil to knock us out? Are we going to quit on our Savior Jesus Christ? He's gotten some of us to give up on our marriages. He's gotten some of us to forget about our vows that we had or took years ago. He's gotten some of us to give up on one another. We just simply sometimes stop talking to one another. And ultimately, he's gotten some of us to quit on Jesus. Are we going to quit on Jesus? Are we going to allow the devil's influence and power to get us to have such a spirit of apathy and indifference? And I don't care about what Jesus has to say and give up on our faith. At times, the devil, his headshots and his body blows have taken a toll on some of us. And many Christians, sadly, have dropped their shield of faith on the battlefield. They have taken off their helmet of salvation and have forgotten about that they have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. They have loosened their belt of truth. They have released their breastplate of righteousness. They've kicked off their shoes that have been prepared to share the gospel of peace. And last, they have dropped their sword, the word of God. And as a result of that, folks, in Ephesians chapter 6, so many people or so many Christians are being pierced by the darts of the devil. He's powerful. We're in a war. And for the Christians at that time, Jesus needed to remind them of the power of the devil. He had succeeded against many of the Christians. And brothers and sisters, we've got to make sure he does not succeed against us. We cannot allow him to defeat us through jealousy, through immorality, 
through fear, through uncertainty, through doubt, through indifference, through apathy. But that's exactly what he wants us to do, even through suffering. Could it be that sometimes we suffer so much because the devil is just really trying to get us to quit on Jesus? You see, this is a message that's being given to the saints in the first century who were enduring a lot of things that the devil, he is real, that he hated them, that he was going to cast some of them into prison, that he's powerful. They were in the midst of his throne. And while all that information was given, there's one big thing that they also needed to remember. And this is the one big thing you need to remember too. Remember all of this, hopefully, okay? But make sure you remember this last point. In the book of Revelation, we see this, brothers and sisters, that the devil, yeah, he's strong, he's powerful, he hates the people of God, he is real, but the devil has been defeated. Can you say amen to that? The devil has been defeated. Yeah, we can look at all the other things that he has, was able to do, whether throwing some of the Christians into prison or killing some of the Christians, but make no mistake about it, the devil has been defeated, and he's been defeated for a very long time. I was reading a book, and it said that the way you shut up the roar of a lion is with another lion that has a greater roar. I don't know if that's true, but I really like it. But what I do know is true in the spiritual realm. The, one you, the, way, that, the way that the one who's like a roaring lion is shut up is by another lion. And you know who I'm talking about, right? In Revelation chapter 5, in verse number 5, remember in Revelation chapter 5, Max taught us about this in Revelation chapter 5. Jesus is described as what? The lion from the tribe of Judah, denoting power, denoting strength. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, so as to open the book and its seven seals. The brethren at that time needed to remember that there was someone greater than their enemy. That one who was greater than their enemy is Jesus Christ. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. And ladies and gentlemen, Jesus, the lion from the tribe of Judah, has silenced the accuser of his people. Jesus, from the, the lion from the tribe of Judah, silenced the devil when he died on Calvary's hill. Jesus, the lion from the tribe of Judah, silenced the devil when he rose from the grave on the first day of the week. And the people of God then, the people of God today, need to be reminded that the devil has already lost. That we have victory, ultimately, through Jesus Christ. Quickly turn back to Revelation chapter 12. Yes, the devil is described as a mighty or great red dragon in Revelation chapter 12. We read some of this earlier. Did you catch and see how the devil, though, he's not strong. He's not, he's not as strong as God. He is not everlasting. He's not running the show. The devil ultimately loses. Verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. The devil is not as strong as God, folks. And he is not the one in charge in heaven. God is the one in charge, and God is the one who sets the tone. The devil was the one who was thrown out of heaven, down into the earth. That shows us that his defeat, his defeat already began a long time ago. When you turn over to Revelation chapter 20, in Revelation chapter 20, as we see judgment in Revelation chapter 20, in verse number 3, talking about Satan, that he was bound, or verse number 2, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. It's the idea that the devil is going to be the devil is not going to be victorious. The devil ultimately is going to lose. You see this progression throughout the book. And then in verse number 10 of Revelation chapter 20, we see one day the devil is going to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone forever. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were, are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Have you thought about that? The devil one day is ultimately going to be thrown into hell. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25. But notice the devil, he's going to suffer day and night forever. You see, the devil, my friend, he's already been defeated. And the one that defeated him was Jesus, the lion from the tribe of Judah. The people of God needed to hold on to that. And they were reminded that they could overcome, that they could defeat the devil, that they could resist him, and that he would flee. 
Look back in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're not going to look at all these verses here, but I want you to notice. There are certain words that are repeated over and over and over again. In Revelation chapter 2, remember, look at the end of each of these letters in verse number 7. He who has an ear, let him hear. Chapter 2, verse 7. What the Spirit says to the church is to him who overcomes. Look at verse number 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church is he who overcomes overcomes. In verse number 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. You see, Jesus was emphasizing to his people that, yes, you have an enemy, but I have already over, I've already defeated him. And as a result of that, you will be able to overcome. You can be victorious spiritually. You can make it to heaven. The point of all of this is that the devil is already lost. He's already lost. And he's going to spend eternity in hell. He's going to suffer day and night. Judgment, ultimate judgment is going to eventually come upon him. And we've got to make sure that we don't end up in hell with him. You see, Jesus has given us another way to take. That we can be victorious and that we can be in heaven with him one day. Revelation, it's a book for times like these. We are living in the midst of Satan's throne. He is the prince of this world, but make no mistake about it, my friends. Jesus has all power and authority. That's Matthew 28. That's Revelation chapter 12. And every day, yeah, we see the devil's power, but don't forget about the power of Jesus. Don't forget about the power that he had when he rose from the grave on the first day of the week. Resist the devil and he will flee. That's a promise from God. Overcome his tactics overcome his devices, trust in God's way and his word, and know that your faithfulness, my faithfulness, will be rewarded when we remain with Jesus. Do you believe that? The brethren in Revelation 2 and 3, they were to believe that. Yeah, the devil has a loud roar, but don't let that intimidate you. If that's caused you to take your shield of faith or to drop it or to take off your breastplate of righteousness, you need to pick that back up right now and keep on fighting because this fight's going to continue. And we have an enemy. He is real and he's coming after us, but we need to hold on to Jesus because Jesus has already given us the victory. Don't question God. Don't question Jesus. Don't be deceived. We are on the winning side. And what this means for us, just as it meant for the people then, we must remain with Jesus. We are on the winning side. Keep your armor on and keep fighting for King Jesus. And when we do, we will have great blessings to enjoy one day. Let's not be deceived. As God's people, have we been, been deceived? At the end of each other of those letters, for the most part, God's people, they were told to repent and to be zealous and if we have been deceived by apathy, indifference, sexual immorality, false teaching, whatever the case may be, things that we should not be following, things that we should not be doing, certain people in our lives that are influencing us the wrong way, then Jesus is telling us right here, right now, repent and remember your first love. And if you're not a child of God, Jesus wants you to do the same thing. He wants you to repent and he wants you to follow him. He wants you to believe that he is the son of God, that he came to defeat the devil, that he rose from the grave on the first day of the week, and that he can give you redemption, eternal life, if you're willing to submit to him and to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If there's someone subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as we sing.